customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny's Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J-O-N-E-S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option please, Jenny. Uh, £25 did you say? Unfortunately not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case I'll take the second option. Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be 32 waist, you know, but these days it's more like 36. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, 34? I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a 32. 30, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. OK, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size 45. Hmm. By my calculations, that's a uh, 10 in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down on your order. Dark grey, I presume? Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt, by the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is 17 and a half. Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a 15, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one- and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one, then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. 
This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. What would you say, Mr Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't of course rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown... It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few, and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Grillers, tigers, leopards and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport, or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns, and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death at so much ahead on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but... We shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr Murray. 
but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out. And by that time, it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, They'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's Thesaurus. Now, Roger's Thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word Thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's Thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, 
We know Roger classified the English language, but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London. He was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there, and graduated when he was nineteen years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor. Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then, ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera, and he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr. Roger to thank. So, how did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his seventies. So, what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852, and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic. So you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglian New. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.